a few things about tonight. One is that uh, this is basically our uh, second anniversary uh, here at the Interval. And it started with uh, another book event by another Wired editor, uh, Adam Rogers, when he launched his book, Proof. You can see we didn't quite have our chalkboard robot yet. We didn't even have our shelves for all the booze yet. Um, so we were kind of a pre-opening for that. But it's, uh, it's great that we've made it to, to year two. Uh, as you know, we kind of started the interval as a nonprofit to really have a different model of interacting with all the people like you, that we didn't want to have the only model of a nonprofit be to have our hands out um, and asking for a donation, but more to have a transactional model that's more like a business. And it is a business, and it's thriving, which has been really great, thanks to all of you. Um, as you know, we raised the ticket prices for tonight um, for the general uh, group, as well as the patron tickets. So thank you all um, for getting those tickets. Um, that's to support this series overall throughout the year. Um, we don't operate this series at a, at a profit, but the rest of the thing does work at a profit. So this is how we're kind of balancing that out. So thank you very much. Um, a couple other announcements. We do have a live stream for all of our members of these talks um, that's sponsored by Ed Bertinsky, one of our previous speakers, um, in his new movie, Anthropocene. Uh, and then um, we're, for the first time, I'm announcing that we're going to start to uh, podcast and do video of this series um, with a grant from the Elks Family Foundation. So we'll start to see some of those coming out. So we're going to get at least 12 to 14 coming out uh, later this year, um, which we're excited about. Um, so yeah, so it's June 7th. It's uh, when we opened the, the bar two years ago. June 6th is when Stuart Brand incorporated long now 20 years ago, yesterday. So it's our 20th birthday also. Um, so yeah, so a few birthdays. Um, and uh, just so you know, the next talk we have coming up is Andrew, Andrew Chignell, who's also in the audience from Casbis. Um, and I think that's most of our announcements. The, the format of the talk tonight is going to be a little bit different. Uh, as many of you know, Kevin's also speaking in the series that Stuart Brand hosts. Uh, at, um, it'll be at the Herbst Theater, 900 people. It'll be a little bit different feeling than the, the talk you're about to get uh, with 60 people. And so he's going to do a shortened version of the talk and then make it much more interactive. We're going to have two mics so we can really uh, move that around. And so the goal is to really make the second half of the talk one where you're getting some, uh, some questions in and, and we really make it into a conversation. Um, and then uh, his book, The Inevitable, as I said, just came out today, literally. And so you can get it, and then after the talk, he'll be signing them up here at the podium. You can buy them in the back right there. With that, our, one of our founding board members, Kevin Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. So as to repeat what uh, Xander said, I am really very privileged and honored that people have decided to contribute to this series by paying a little bit extra for the tickets. Thank you for coming out and doing that. Um, there are a lot of familiar faces, many faces I haven't seen. Um, and also to repeat what um, Xander said, uh, because I'll be talking at this same subject a little bit at length, I've decided to try and do a very kind of blitz version of one of the trends, and then I'm gonna do something experimental. So what I will do for the other part of it is actually, I have a list of questions that I don't know the answers to. So the book is really stuff that I'm sure about. So I have a bunch of things that I don't know what my answers are, and I'm gonna actually kind of have you help me answer them. I'd like to hear what your answers are, and I'll talk and give my, my side of it, and we can think out loud. So this is the, most of this talk will be about things that I'm not sure about. The first part of it is stuff that I am sure about. So um, that's the format, and I thought this would be a little bit more conducive to this uh, group here, this venue. We can interact. I want to hear what you have to say about some of these ideas. And um, I'll, there'll still be enough of me in it. So um, what I want to do then is kind of give you, um, let's see, which one am I going is it down this way? Yeah. Um, a version of one of the um, <coughs> trends that I'm thinking about, the one actually I think is the most important, which is, um, you'll see, this is Cognify, but the general title, Inevitable, is um, used in a soft way, I mean it in a kind of a soft way that there is baked into the very physics of 
the materials, transistors, wires, um, batteries, the whole, the whole thing, that, that it tends to lean in certain directions. And that that leaning is something that we can actually discern and therefore say it's going to lean in this direction and that is where it's going. And that's the way I use inevitable, that, there, that these things, that this bias is built in and I'm trying to identify the bias. Okay? And so electrical wires, waves, these all produce recurring effects and that these recurring effects for me are most visible in the ways in which technology are used and unofficially, the way that they aren't supposed to be used the way that they're abused, the way that the street uses them, to use Bill, Bill Gibson's terms. So that's where I like to pay attention to, is how people are using the technology in the ways that it wasn't supposed to be used, because I think we get a better sense of where this bias is going to. And if we can identify the bias, that's what the technology wants, that's the inherent direction that it's going. So the long-term trends, I think, are actually predictable in that sense of we can see where they have been going and they will tend to go in that direction, but the specifics are not at all predictable. So the genres are, the species are not. So um, an example would be the quadruped form is kind of inevitable. There's going to be them because that's the form in animal life. There's many, many forms of quadrupeds those are predictable, but the zebra is not, okay? And so in the same sense, you could say telephones are inevitable. If you make wires and electricity, you're going to make a telephone system, but the iPhone is not predictable. It's completely contingent. Um, the Internet was inevitable, but Twitter was not. The Internet was inevitable, but the kind of Internet that we could make or want to make we have a choice in, whether it's international, national, commercial, or non-commercial. Those are all choices that we had. They make a lot of difference to us, and they're not inevitable. So I'm talking about the larger scale trends, the, the, the more of the biases built into this that are leaning in certain directions. And those directions, I think, are important because they are the main drivers, and we can expect them and we can prepare for them and um, they are going to do the large-scale genre forms. So I have 12 trends in this book but they're basically umbrella categories to put lots of things under them. So they're not necessarily, they're, they're somewhat arbitrary but they're, they're groupings and they all by the way are verbs or gerunds because I think one of the moves that we're seeing is this move from physical nouns to verbs to things that are always in process, to this liquid world. That's one of the trends. So I think in terms of, of these verbs. And I'm going to take one of them. Um, there are others like tracking. So let me just say it very simply that we're moving to a world where there's more and more tracking. We're tracking ourselves with Fitbits, quantified self. We're tracking each other's when we take a photograph and tag it of our friends. Companies are tracking us, the governments are tracking us. I'd see nothing in the near future of 25 years where there's less tracking. There's going to be more of it because the Internet is a tracking machine and it wants to track and it, anything that can be tracked, it touches it, it will be tracked. So there's that kind of a, of a thing. I'm not going to talk more about that, but there's sharing the same ways. There's this flowing of streams of things rather than fixed entities. The thing I want to talk about in this brief intro is cognifying, is making things smarter. I use this word, it's an obscure word, because smartify, smarting, there's no, we don't have a good verb for making things smarter, but that's what we're doing. We're, we're taking everything and we're making it smarter, and we're taking, making some dumb things a little smart, and we're taking some smart things are making them much smarter. That process is ongoing, and if you make a transistor, if you make a logic gate, once you have that, you will inev inevitably make things smarter and smarter and smarter. So we're moving in the direction where this AI stuff is coming, and we don't really have much choice if we keep making technology uh, about it getting smarter and smarter, but we do have a lot of choice about how we make it smart and you know, what we do with it, the specifics. So um, I think AI is once, 
is, is pretty inevitable once you've made um, these kinds of things. And the proof, of course, is that it's already here. I mean, that's the thing, is, is that AIs diagnose x-rays much better than humans do. They go through legal evidence much better than a human para lawyer, lawyer would do. They, uh, if you're flying on a flight commercially, the pilot, human pilots are flying seven to eight minutes. The AI is doing the rest of it. And your little chips in your brakes break much better than, than you do. And that's why um, the AI is in the brake of your cars. So, um, and of course, AlphaGo from Google recently be beat the world um, Go master. We all see that. That's now, that's happening, that's done. But uh, some interesting stuff is Google actually has the same AI that they learned how to, um, they taught it to learn how to play a video game. They, teaching it to play a video game was trivial, but they taught it how to learn to play the video game. So they just showed it a video game, and it's on the screen, and it learned how to play the video game by trial and error, and within a day of playing all the time, it could be a human. So it didn't know how to play, didn't know anything about the rules, it was just watching, playing the game just as much as you would. So this kind of artificial learning is, is very important. But the thing about AI is, is that we have this vocabulary challenge, which is that whenever we accomplish something, we no longer call it AI. Once it can do something, it's called machine learning or something or algorithmic stuff. So AI is basically defined as that which we can't do. So it's always receding into the future. So AI is, is, is you know, stuff that we can't do, that want to do, and once we can do it, it's no longer AI. It's obvious, it's trivial, it's just machine algorithmic stuff. It's not AI. So part of what talking about it becomes difficult is, is, is that there, there is this definitional challenge. So I think there are three reasons why AI is worth paying attention to right now. And the first one has to do with the fact that um, our own intelligence has a very incomplete and inaccurate assessment of what it is, all right? We don't know what, what intelligence is, basically. But the, the one thing I, I, I'm pretty sure about is, is that IQ is not a single vector. It's not a single dimension, although we tend to think of it as. If we have IQ, there's the rat and the mouse and the chimp, and then there's a really dumb person, and then there's us, me, and then there's Einstein, and then there's the super thing. It's all, it's like, it's like louder, it's, it's like a sound that gets louder and louder, and that's what we think of normally. But that's totally, totally wrong. What uh, AI is much more like, what intelligence, excuse me, is much more like, is a, a kind of a symphony of different um, notes played on different instruments, and each of those instruments is a different kind of cognition. So we have this society of mind, we have this sort of symphony of many different kinds of thinking. Um, Cognitive reasoning, deduction, spatial navigation, memory. There's, 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 we don't even know, maybe hundreds of different types of thinking that are aggregated into what we call intelligence. And we generally think of human intelligence as general purpose, but it's absolutely not general purpose. It's specifically to our species for our evolution. And we'll see as we make other kinds that it's just, we'll have the same Copernican overthrow that we had with the idea that we were at the center of, of the solar system and we realized we're in the corner, we're going to say the same thing as we inhabit or, or fill out the, the, the space of possible intelligence. Is we'll see that our intelligence is just in the corner. It's just one very, very specific kind of intelligence made up of this, this basket of different kinds of thinking. But the thing about intelligence is that animals have a, a, uh, another basket of them. And some of their instruments are the same as ours, the same, same kind of thinking. But in some cases, they're actually superior or exceeding ours. So the rat may have a superior intelligence for spatial navigation. Or the, the, the monkey may have um, an even higher level of social intelligence. And so th they're higher in some, and they'll be lower or inferior in others. But there's a completely different basket. It's a different kind of thinking. And likewise, with the AI that we're going to make, the machines, where um, some will engineer that so that some of them are um, much superior to us uh, in that instrument, much louder than ours. And the point I want to make is that that is why we're going to make those AIs, is because they 
exceed us in these other dimensions. They can think differently from us. And that's what we want. So we have this artificial smartness, which I like to use more than artificial intelligence because smartness takes away some of that baggage that we have associated with intelligence. These are all different ways of being smart. And your calculator today is already smarter than you are in arithmetic. <laughs> but we're not freaked out by that because it's very narrow, it's very specific. And your GPS is much smarter than you in, in spatial navigation, and Google is much smarter than you in recall. And so these are all these artificial types of smartness. And we're going to enge engineer much more complicated and complex baskets, salads of these kinds of intelligences. And as they become broader, they will become more robust. But they will never really be general purpose because, I mean, we'll have Swiss Army knives versions, but they will be like a Swiss Army knife. They will be very, very uh, timid and, 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 and broad, but not very deep in any one thing. So um, again, the point of making uh, these artificial minds is that they don't think like humans, and therefore, when you put them into the car, they don't drive like humans. The reason why we want the auto-driven cars is because they aren't driving like us. They, it's, they're non-human. And the fact that, that they don't have a consciousness is actually a, a feature. So we're going to advertise them as being conscious-free <laughs> because they aren't worried about whether they should have majored in finance or whether they have <laughs> left the stove on or whatever. They are focused on driving. They're really optimized to have that intelligence, that road intelligence, we may want to call it. So that sense of making these non-human-like intelligences is sort of what we're doing. There, there is this kind of space of possible minds that we are unaware of right now, um, except maybe in the animal kingdom. And even that, we don't have any kind of measurements for different kinds of animal minds, but we should. But we're going we're to inhabit the possibility space of intelligence by making all these artificial minds. And they're all different kinds of thinking. They're all different species of thinking. So I would like to think of it, while we have all species among the animal kingdom, we have all minds, all kinds of all species of minds that are before us. And our job is sort of, in, in a kind of a cosmic sense, is, is to make or discover these kinds of minds that biology probably couldn't get to by itself. So we're, the, the, the kinds of minds that the tissue can make, DNA can make, are limited. But we're going to actually, through us, populate all the other kinds of thinking that you could do that the biology alone could not get to. So there's lots of very different kinds of minds. And I think that some of the most um, uh, intractable, mysterious questions we have, say, about dark energy, quantum gravity, we may need these alternative kinds of minds to work with us to solve them. So human intelligence alone may not be sufficient to solve them. We, our, our first job is kind of like a, a two-step thing, is to invent these other kinds of thinking to help us work with us to solve these problems. And we see some of that kind of evidence right now in doing uh, computer proofs for mathematics where we actually don't even understand the proof, we just rely on the fact that there is this mind that says, yeah, that's right. And so we'll be making other kinds of minds like this. And so, um, as I said, they may be needed for solving some of our hardest problems. I like to think of these things as alien intelligences. You may think of these as kind of artificial aliens because they will be thinking differently than us. And they will have some of the attributes of actually contacting ET, um, e even beyond just the being able to think and have that practical reason. I think also they will have other attributes that we might associate with higher levels of intelligence, like, say, consciousness or self-reflection. And so they might give us much of the same kind of high that we would have by having contact with an alien intelligence, which who knows if it will happen, but it's very certain that we will make them here on Earth. So that's one thing, this idea of making different kinds of thinking, and that's the feature of them. That's the reason why we want to make them. So the second idea is, is that um, I think we really are kind of involved in a second industrial revolution. That's one of the terms. So you remember the first industrial revolution was primarily about um, artificial power. So instead of everything being built in the world with human muscle or animal muscle, we invented this thing called artificial power, which was primarily fueled by fossil fuels or 
carbon feels like wood. And um, through that system, we could do all these amazing things, and basically the entire prosperity that we see around us now today is feeding off of the fact that we had this, we harnessed these artificial powers. And so when you're going down the highway, you have 250 horses that you're using at, at the command of this little switch. And there are 250 horses sending you down the highway. And so that's automated power. And, that's, and, and we took that same kind of automated synthetic power and we put it into a grid, electrical grid, and sent it out to out the whole country and other countries later. And that distributed power, artificial power, was, again, the foundation of the automation of factories, of homesteads, of farms. And anybody, anywhere, could plug into that. You could purchase this artificial power. You didn't have to generate it yourself. You could just buy as much as you wanted to and do what you wanted with it. And you could even be innovative. And you could take something like a, a hand pump that took muscle, and you could say, hey, I'm going to take some of that artificial power, and I'm going to add the power, and I'm going to get an uh, electrical pump. And that was this, the source of a lot of the wealth and, and innovation. And in fact, what was curious about it was, in the beginning, companies had the VPs of electricity. <laughs> there was somebody in charge, because this was a complicated stuff. It was, it, was, it was new, unknown, it was messy, nobody knew how it worked. So you had your VP of electricity, who was in charge of electrifying the company. Okay. And so now what we're doing is we're taking those electrical things and we're adding artificial intelligence, artificial smartness, and we're making the smart pumps, okay? okay? And the, the, the thing about it is, is, is in the same way, we're, we're, we're going to get that from a grid. You're not going to have to generate that AI yourself. You're just going to purchase it as much as you want from this cloud grid. It'll be like electricity. It will be available. You buy as much AI as you want or can afford. And so um, this thing will basically, instead of having, in addition to having 250 horses in your car, you'll now have 250 minds as well. And that's the auto-driven car. That's the smart car. That's the, the driverless car. So we'll now have all that kind of uh, artificial power. And that same thing that we did with cars, we're just going to do with everything else. So, every, so I would say that everything we've electrified, we're now going to cognify. Okay? And, and, and the consequences of that will be equal and exceed the first industrial revolution in terms of what it unleashes. Because just as I can go there and I can get 250 horsepower or 1,000 people worth of energy and muscle, whatever, we'll now go and get 1,000 people worth of brains to do whatever it is we want to waste it on. Because that's, <laughs> that's where the real innovation happens is when you waste it. Okay, so um, my formula for the next 10,000 startups is very easy. Take X, whatever X is, add AI. <laughs> Find something and add AI to it that you buy, that you get off the grid, that's just you purchase. But if AI is a commodity, as I'm suggesting, then you can also reverse that and say something like, well, you take AI, you have to add X to it. Just like you, you know, if you take a commodity, water, Everybody has, you have to add something special to it, a story, an interface, something to make it different, because it is a commodity. So it works both ways. So, but this is a combination of X plus AI. And here's the thing. Um, this is a, a Google, uh, well, this is actually a, a Google service, but this is an example of somebody where you can actually ha query the AI and ask these questions of what, what color is the ground, what color is the ball, and it's telling you. It, I mean, it understands, it sees the picture, it's giving you back. You can buy that service from Google today, right now, for six cents a thousand, a hundred hits. So, so it's 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 available now today, as a cloud service. You can just buy your AI, and that's the second thing. So it's it's a commodity you'll be able to purchase in anybody who wants to. Okay. So the third thing that is is worth thinking about AI right now is is that uh, when we put the AI into a body, we call that a robot. This is uh, a kind of robot from Rodney Brooks at MIT, who's now with iRobot, and Heartland, uh, I think it's called uh, Rethink Robots. And the, the idea is, is, is that this one, instead of being, an, it's an industrial robot, but instead of being one that you have to program, you actually show it what you want it to do, and it's watching what you do. And so it can work with people who are illiterate, 
It can work right next to people because it's also aware of its surroundings, unlike most industrial robots. And so it's a call, called a personal robot in the same sense of a personal computer, meaning you don't need a priesthood of people to service it. Anybody can buy it and you can put it in your garage. Okay, and so the, th the reason, what we're gonna use these for, the robots and the automation, is anything that can be specified in terms of productivity or efficiency. And that includes physical work, blue collar work, as well as most of white collar work. If you have something, a task, that can be specified in terms of efficiency or productivity, it's gonna go to the bots. Okay, so productivity is for bots, it's not for humans. What humans are really good at I was kind of joking earlier, is, is, is um, uh, wasting time, <laughs> okay? I mean, inefficiency. So most of our jobs are a bunch of tasks, and some of those tasks will go to the bots, and the other aspects of them will just be changed. And so our tasks will more and more revolve around the stuff that are inefficient. So what's in it? Well, I mean, science is inherently inefficient. You, you're not going to do experiments that you know that work. If, if, you, if science was efficient, you would just do the same experiment over and over again because you know it worked. As soon as you start to do experiments that fail, which is the main instrument of learning, you're inefficient. Innovation is inherently inefficient because you're just making mistakes, you're trying stuff that doesn't work. That's not efficient. It's incredibly inefficient. The same thing with the human experiences, which are not very efficient by, by definition. So all these things in art, are the kinds of things, are the kind, the aspects, the tasks that we are good at and will be for a long while, while the bots are really good at things that we can specify and uh, or care about in terms of productivity. So the last thing is, is, is um, the, the, the real driver, I think, is actually this idea of a centaur, which came out of Gary Kasparov, the IBM chess champion who lost I mean, the chess champion who lost to IBM Deep Blue, and he complained about the fact that Deep Blue had access to a complete database of every single chess move ever made. And he said, if I had access to the same database, I could have beat Deep Blue. So he made up a new chess league, kind of a freestyle, where you could play as a human, an AI, or a centaur, AI plus human. And for the last three or four years, the best ch uh, chess player in the world is not an AI, and it's not a human chess master. It's a centaur. It's a team of AI plus human. And that's true for the best diag medical diagnostic. It's not a AI and it's not a doctor. It's a doctor plus AI. And so that idea of working with machines, of having them complement our type of thinking with their type of thinking is actually where we're going. So I believe that you'll be paid in the future by how well you work with these AIs. Okay, so, so, so they're not, we're not working against them, we're gonna be working with them because they think differently and if you can actually, if you can be the horse whisperer, you can be the AI whisperer and understand, then you have an advantage in terms of um, being able to, to be the best in your class. So we'll work with them, not against them. So I, I just wanna end with a generic call to the future which is that, by the way, there are no AI experts. Right, there are a lot of people who are working in AI right now. There's a ton of money going into it. But in terms of long view, there are no AI experts. We, don't need, we have no idea, really. We're just at the beginning of the beginning, okay? So the greatest invention which today, some people might say, was the web, did not exist 25 years ago. Okay, if I was giving this talk 25 years ago, I wouldn't have mentioned the web because it hadn't been invented yet. So I think in 25 years from now, it's very likely that the major thing there is probably not AI, but something that hasn't been invented yet today. It's almost statistically probable, okay? So we're at the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of the beginning, we're at hour one, and that means that you're not late. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> okay. So that's what I know. Now I want to talk about what I don't know, okay? And what I have actually is I have a list of questions that I don't know the answers to, that I would like to know the answers to, that I'm not sure about, that I may have some ideas about, but I'm, I just don't know. And so what I thought I would do is 
read a question, and then if somebody has an answer, I'll take one, I'll take one suggested answer, and then we'll talk about it. I'll, I'll add some, some things to it, and then we'll move on to another one. So, so uh, this is an experiment. It could, it could fail. Um, Can I suggest keep it brief? Keep it very, very brief. <laughs> and I'll cut you off. If, if, uh, <laughs> no, I have no hesitation there. And, um, um, and so, um, uh, again, these are things that I'm kind of turning over my own mind, struggling with, and, and whatnot. So I, I'll, I'll start the first one. It has to do with, with AI. And as you can see, I'm very enthusiastic about it. I'm, I'm very, very positive about it. But here's something I do struggle with is I wonder if we are going to be comfortable with treating robots like slaves. Even if they aren't, whether, whether that's a kind of corrosive stance to have with them. And if you've seen the uh, dyna uh, Boston Dynamics of the guys and people kicking those things and we cringe, that's suggesting to me we may not be. So even though we have all these things and they're doing all the stuff, it's like, well, what is, how are we going to feel about that? And I'm of two minds. One is this, this machines will get used to it and we won't cry when we turn them off. And the other one is, no, we're just, we're, we're going we're gonna to really have to have a whole different set of ethics and, and, and a, we'll educate ourselves to treat them differently. And, I, and I, right now, I don't know myself. So uh, I see it, I saw, I'm going to look at the person who has her hand up before I even finish that one. Okay, yeah. yeah. So this is, this is purely anecdotal, but it has to do with Boston Dynamics. So down at Fort Bragg, they took Big Dog out with a platoon to test how the guys are going to use it in the field. And the guys kept protecting their big dog and putting themselves in harm way because it was their team member. And it was, so it wasn't beating up on them or you go through, sucker. It was all looking after their robot. And this is also seen in the field in, in Iraq when they send in bottom disposal groups with iRobot. The guys won't work with a new replacement bot. They will wait for that one to be at least 50% of it comes back because it's part of their guys. So it's interesting to see that the initial usage for these things, we're not being mean. We're being yeah. very careful. That's fabulous. Thank you. I love that. So I'll, I'll take one more question. Uh, answer. Answer, excuse me. <laughs> so uh, Ben, if you could come over here. Somebody young. So I think possibly a more apt comparison that feels to me is rather than slaves, pets is yeah. how we treat pets, looking at the already emergent robot pets and the story you were saying that humans don't see pets as equal, but they're still very willing to make great sacrifices and feel deep, deep emotional attachments to their pets. Right, okay, that's, that, that's good, okay. So Ryan, if we could get so there. Just one more comment on this. It's not just pets, it's our use of language. So as right. soon as Alexa came into our household, I started saying things to Stuart like, Stuart, would you get the, you know, and, <laughs> you know, and, or Stuart, tell Alexa. And I, we started saying, please, yeah. Alexa. And <laughs> because, thank you. And thank you, Alexa, because it was changing our actual dynamic of yeah, how we yeah. talk to each other. So right. it, this is fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. So, all right, that's, that's good. I'm going to, um, uh, we, well, maybe we'll come back to that because I think there's a lot to say. And, um, uh, it's hard for me to kind of extrapolate to see which way I, even I would go because I don't I don't know and, and and also I think we can change our minds too collectively with this with this experience so pets is a, is a good analogy besides slaves but we maybe we'll have slaves and pets okay that's that's possible that there's different categories and um, it, it is interesting that um, if those quadruped Boston Dynamics were a different shape we would definitely feel differently about them. If they had wheels, yeah. we're okay with that. And we were just, Xander and I were talking about, I was just attended the first uh, self-driving car race. Okay, so self-driving car racing. And uh, the thing about it is that you'll kind of look forward to them crashing because there's, you, know, you know there's nobody in, inside. And so we kind of like to see machines destroying each other in kind of a way. If they had wheels, but if they were kind of like animals shape, would we feel that comfortable? So, so this may be something where there's all kinds of signifiers and just the, whether they have legs or don't, it's kind of strange. 
So maybe, again, we might educate ourselves to decide that legs don't really matter. So um, another question that I had was, um, uh, what are the, the, I talk about total tracking in, in this book a lot and um, the fact that I, I think everything I look at suggests that, that, that we will have thousands or hundreds of more, time, more tracking than we have right now and, and that we won't be able to stop it. And let me just give you the, the analogy. So, so I, um, I think there's inherent um, propensity in, in the internet kind of technology to, to copy things. That's the way things get across the internet is they're being copied all along the ways. And so it's kind of built and has a bias to copy stuff. And so uh, the way I would describe it is that the internet is the world's largest copy machine. And anything that could possibly be copied, if it touches it, it's get copied. So if you have a movie, a music, a book, and it touches the internet, it will be copied indiscriminately and flow across everywhere in a kind of a super distribution liquid. And, um, and so trying to, so the, the music industry for 20 years tried to work against that bias. They were trying to go up against the grain of this thing, which is wanted to copy, and they wanted to prohibit copy, copy protection, digital rights management, sue the customer who's copying a lot, and it didn't work for two decades. And they tried and tried, and gradually they're coming around to, to accepting the fact that they can't stop the copying. They have to work with the copying. That's the only way to do, to do it. And I would make the same analogy that the internet is the world's largest tracking machine. And anything that can be tracked, if it touches the internet, will be tracked. And, the, and you can't stop the tracking. You can kind of fight against it, prohibit it. You can do what the music industry did. It's like, we want less of it. Um, we won't allow it. We'll legislate it. But it's going to be at odds with the general bias in this technology to track everything. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm really, I wrote this big article about VR for Wired. I am also think that that's coming very fast. If when you are in a VR world, you're basically in a total surveillance world. Everything is inherently being tracked, all your movements, and that when we have the backward facing cameras that will record your micro expressions so that your avatar will be you, um, and you will know a little bit about what frightens you, where you are, how you do, and as you spend more time, this will become a huge amount of data, so you'll be able to be tracked there and in ways that you could do it in real life very expensively, it'll be cheap and ubiquitous within VR. So, VR will, is inherently more tracking. And so if that's true, if, if, there, if there is a sense in which um, there is uh, ubiquitous tracking and we, we have to work with it. So I'm interested in how we work with it. And so one of the ideas in the book I talk about is covalence, a symmetrical knowledge about you watch the watchers, you, you hold them accountable, you have some benefit, et cetera, which is not inevitable. I think that's one of the ways that we can do it, but it's not inevitable. It's, it's, it's one possible way. But at the same time, um, I'm also trying to think about um, what the limits are to this. Is there actually hard lines about um, what we just simply won't l let to be tracked? and where that is. And then as I examine my own life to say, well, what is it? Is there something inherently that is just at the edge? And um, what would that look like? And what does that look like for other people? So, so, so what are the actual limits of transparency in which we simply as people are not going to accept? Because here's the thing, we have evolved until recent times through hundreds of thousands of years, we evolved without privacy, right? So, so, so in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the tribal clan, there was, the only privacy you had was in your head because everything else was visible to everybody else and everybody knew what you were doing and you knew what they were doing and that was, that's how we evolved biologically. So we're, this is not foreign to us. This state of mutual watching is absolutely how we evolved and so, what was at that time, the only, li the only limit was what you had in your head. Those, those were private. The, everything else was shared. So I'm asking myself, was that, is that what the limit is? Is just what's inside my head or is there something else? So 
Out there, okay, here's a question. Help me think. Way in the back, somebody has their hand up. Way in the back. We'll just wait for the microphone. The final postulation of the question. So the final postulation of the question is, what are the limits to transparency? If, if, you, if you believe that basically, I'm like, like how, or, or you could say, what's the limit to, to, to what, what's the most, uh, but what's, 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 what's the most essential amount of privacy in which you, there's no, n no negotiating on? What, what's the minimal, maybe it's the way, what's the minimal privacy that you would accept? Oops. So, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I think it comes down to what we're willing to pay for and what we're willing to take for free. So, if you're willing to take no, free... No, let's talk about you. What, yeah. What, what's your limit? Me? Uh, I, I personally, I, I'm, I'm very open, I think. Anything I do online, I, I have no limits. How about, uh, how about uh, uh, offline? Offline? Honestly, like, I... I've given up on my privacy. Okay, how about yeah. within your head? I don't even own blinds on my apartment. How about, how, about, <laughs> how, about, how about within your head? Would you mind if we could read your thoughts? If, if you could read everyone else's thoughts, then I'd be fine with that. Okay, all right, there you go. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, yeah. so, okay, someone else. Um, right in the middle, right there. You, yeah, put your hand up. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so that guy. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with what you're punished for. So ah. one, of the, one of the problems with transparency, <clears throat> having run some more transparent companies, is that, um, that transparency can be indistinguishable from public shaming. And so I think that that's something we're going to have to reckon with, which is that um, you know, when, when your thoughts are in your head and not so many people have access to it, right. there are fewer people that, you can, that can punish you for your thoughts. But as those things become transparent, then you kind of get you know that problem. And I think um, Marshall McLuhan kind of said something about that with the original formulation right, of the global right. village. Yeah, exactly. You know, we could actually though, though we could actually have punishment that were much more attuned to those kinds of private transgressions. So right now we make a big deal about them, but we could certainly tone those down and and say, okay, you're speeding, but but that is is. Uh, the fact that there was nobody around so it makes it okay. So we actually have kind of more of a dynamic sense of the law. So that's one way we could actually work with that in terms of how we're punished for, for those transgressions. So uh, I'll take one more question. Yes, right here. One more answer, excuse me. Jeopardy. Yes, Jeopardy is <laughs> right. <laughs> I have the questions, you have the answers. Just yeah. to play off what you just said. Yeah. Within a VR environment, right. are there morals? Right. Are there? Well, that well, yes. Yeah. So, so um, I, I think there might be worlds where that would be something that the person who made those worlds might have a, have more say than others. Maybe you aren't allowed to do things, or maybe you're punished for doing certain things in a world that had a, a moral code. So I think that might go world by world. That would be interesting. I mean, we have a kind of a little bit of that right now with different online systems that treat, say, anonymity differently or transgressions. They have different policies. So you could say they have different moral codes. You may be kicked off one faster than another for doing something. So I think worlds would definitely have that. And, and, and by the way, uh, related to that, um, we're teaching robots ethics. So there's a group in Stanford and actually group Google who's teaching these self-driving cars ethical rules because um, when you have a crash or something, you could imagine, well, does the car turn towards the divider and harm the uh, driver at the risk of turning away from the pedestrian? So who, who gets favored? And, and we give our humans, we give ourselves a pass because we don't have time to think about it, but the robots actually do have time to think about it and they have to be thought about before in terms of the program. And so in a certain sense, we're really lousy. Humans are lousy with ethics. We're inconsistent, we're not very advanced, we're, uh, we don't go very deep with it, but we're actually gonna teach these self-driving robots to be better than us. And I think eventually they will kind of come back. They will teach us to be better ethically by us having to teach them. And so um, uh, I, I, I think that's, so, so I think there's an, a, a chance to actually in terms of putting moral codes and ethical things into these artificial worlds that, that we actually have a chance to actually make ourselves better 
because we're pretty lousy at it right now. We think we're really good at it, but we're not. Kev, so, yes, Kevin, you know, uh, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> it's the microphone guy. Yeah. Um, so I, I was just, I just saw a VR thing that it's a European group that put together, I think a nonprofit, that focuses on that self-driving car right. conundrum and uh, kind of brings together all the things really nicely. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll post it to the Interval okay, or the Long Now Twitter, but it, uh, it, it questions should insurance companies, should um, does the individual be over uh, overruled and, and should they have any say in it if right. we could see the costs and right. human life and dollars that would okay. happen around it? So the next question is um, that I'm asking myself is, um, one of the things I posit in this book is, is this kind of really kind of weird situation where, where we have this abundancy and we have more and more of the world being made into commodities. So the prices go down and down. And um, the one scarcity which was observed by Herbert Simon probably 50 years ago was that the one scarcity in this world of abundance is human attention, which is limited. And it's only, we all have the same amount, 24 hours. And more interestingly, we can't save it up. We have to spend it every day, okay? We have to spend it in real time. Um, and so this, in this kind of a world of abundance, the only scarcity being human attention, it should be the most valuable thing. And yet, we're giving it away free. So one of the things I, I, I see is I can see a kind of a coming disruption in the advertising world, which is the foundation of most of the big money in the internet companies, is what if we charged for our attention? We charged, an, to, we were paid to watch an ad. We were paid to read someone's email, okay? So, we, so that would be very disruptive to the ad agencies because what would happen is that the companies who want attention are gonna pay the customers directly instead of going through this intermediate, which is the advertising companies. Because the advertising companies' pitch was, hey, we have the attention of these people, you don't, so pay us and we'll get their attention to them. So that it, was, it was mediated, but you could go directly and just pay, so to speak, the customers who are influential. And we see that kind of happening right now and you can kind of get these clout scores and you say, oh, that, she's very influential she, and she may have lots of followers and so we'll give her a free product or we'll pay her for her attention. So the question I have is, that I'm asking myself, I don't know the answer to, is how much is my attention worth? How much would I charge? So this guy in the front says, wouldn't that be market determined? Yes. So how much should I charge? So the answer is, I don't know, but what, what do we think it is? What would you start at? What's, your, what's the first price? OK, right here. So the general concept is VRM, or vendor relationship management, flips oh, whoa, whoa, CRM whoa, 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 on its head. No. Vendor relationship management. Okay. So Doc Searles has been working on this for about uh -huh. a decade going, if we inverted the process of having others determine what the ads delivered to our eyeballs right. were worth, right. how would we turn around and set it? So it has to be market-based. And as you said, it's, it's almost a, a digital definition of how differentiated okay, wait, wait, wait. our so economic value is. How much are you is. gonna charge? That's all I wanted to know. How much are you gonna charge? Per ad? Yeah, for your time. How much is your time worth to, to watch an ad? I'd probably come off of $200 an hour. Okay. Anyone else have a, uh, is that where you're going to, anyone else start off cheaper than that? Or, or is that, I mean, or, or, is, 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 is that, and $200, is that just? I just uh, charged you negative $35 for this hour. I mean, yeah, right. you, exactly. I paid you, so <laughs> this is complicated. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's complicated, right? So, so it's like you're willing to pay, but you want to be paid. Is it just kind of a wash? Uh, anyone else have, have an answer? Uh, there's one guy here, and then we'll get you. Okay. So in the back? Yeah. So I currently spend $9.99 uh -huh. to not have Spotify advertised right. to me. So okay. kind of inverse that, right? So you're right. looking at how much am I willing to get paid to have advertising. I don't think $200 is an hour is about where I'm at, but probably around like $50 per 30 second spot. Okay, all right. All right. So uh, uh, there's, there's another gal right here. I wanna hear her and then I have something to say. Right, no, right up here, up front. I got you. Okay. 
I think a lot of people uh, quantify or uh, attach a dollar value to what they spend on services based on what they earn uh -huh. f at their job. And so, you know, let's say I earn $200 an hour at my job, then that would, I would attach that to, as an answer to your question, then it brings up an interesting question. If I earn more an hour, then I get more for ad dollars, and then right. people who earn less get less. Right, okay. So, so I did a calculation in this book here of the uh, total amount of hours of attention given to TV and the total amount of income earned by the advertising companies. And what it works out to is that people who are watching TV are earning the advertising companies 20 cents an hour. 20 cents. Basically, that's what their value of attention is, 20 cents. Okay? And uh, if you do the same calculation for other things, it can get a little higher, but not much higher. The, about the highest it gets is maybe 2 or $3 an hour. So that's what we're giving. That's, the, that's what other people are monetizing our attention at that rate. So it's really, really cheap. It's nowhere near $200. And so that's a kind of a conundrum. It's like, if that's so valuable to us, how come we're giving it away at 20 cents an hour? Because you have to breach the privacy layer to get there. You have to breach the privacy layer to you get there? Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. Do we have the microphone here, please? This, so, Ed, go ahead. Say. Yeah, so, so the value of speaking to you for an hour is different than the value of speaking to your demographic. Uh huh. And so there's two ways it's going to happen, either in a transactional basis, meaning, like, I want to target you with an ad. And this is where we get AI can actually breach that privacy barrier without paying the premium. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So I have time for one more question and answer. I know people have more, but I'm going to do one more because uh, I have five minutes or something. Is that right, Sandra? So, um, uh, this is also about, um, well, actually, that's too complicated. So, um, <laughs> yeah, for in five minutes. So, um, uh, I will go for it. Okay. Um, well, no. Okay. Here, 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 here's the a, a last chapter of the book. Gets really cosmic and spacey, and talks about uh, uh, what I talked about earlier. Long now talk about this idea of the holos, this kind of super organism that we're making with seven billion people connected together, and there's seven billion smartphones and the seven trillion server computers all connected into one large something. It's a super organism machine. It, I call it holos, meaning that there's, there's, there's this emergent global something. And um, I think that a lot of the um, kind of amazing, miraculous things that we, could not, that we could not even envision in the past 20 years have come about because we have made tools that allow us to collaborate in some fashion at a scale that was never before possible. So we have you know, 1.5 billion people on Facebook that in some sense is collaborating at a scale that was simply unthinkable before. And that we're gonna continue to advance that and we'll be able to do things or we will do something with having 7 billion people doing something together. By all estimates, by the year 2025, every adult on the planet will have some device 100% of them will have a device that connects. And so when we have this, this, this huge connection and this ability to do things like Wikipedia, which is simply impossible in theory, there's no theoretical way it could work, and yet it does, and that's because it's, it's harnessed this ability to take a lot of people all around the world and connect them together in a way that was not possible before in doing things collaboratively that we couldn't do. And so a lot of the big, I think, successes and amazing things that we're gonna see in the, in the next 20 years are gonna be due to the fact that we're gonna be able to harness our collective and collaboration at scales in real time that were not possible before. And so the thing I've become interested in is world government, which nobody thinks is a good idea, as far as I can tell. And, um, uh, I'm interested in how seven billion people connected together can in some way steer themselves, can in some way um, be democratic. 
How, how, how does that even possible? And so I, I, I have really no ideas about what that mechanisms would look like. Do you have this kind of another layer hierarchy of representations and, and stuff? Does that, does that work at this scale? Is there something else? Do you have direct voting? Does that, does that, does that even make any sense? And so the question I have, because I don't know any answers in the next three minutes, is does anybody have an idea about how you would do a democratic world government with seven billion people? Woo, hey, okay. Wait a minute, I'm gonna ask somebody, uh, wait, over here, because I haven't been on this side yet, and um, I wanna include them. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's a great question, thanks for asking it. I, I love the idea of two sort of notions of what we already have at our disposal, crowdfunding yeah. and Twitter, this idea of giving a real-time proxy of part of our power. And what would it look like to have simultaneously a sort of internal civic crowdfunding mechanism that worked for the whole world, that worked on a local and a global level, and also where we could give part of our, you know, our specific expertise that we wanted to delegate to somebody. So that system could work in parallel to something that was not fully direct democracy. Okay. It's a balance. So someone else over there have another, I see the person, yes, right here with me, right? There you go. Hold it up to your mouth. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually don't have the mechanism, but I believe that once we see the larger whole, the civilization as the organism, we see holos as a, uh -huh. as a thing, then, then that opens the right. door okay, for the that. Right, the visualization. Great. Okay. If you can pass it to the guy right there. Yes, you there. Okay. You haven't spoken. Thank you. What's, what's um, your, how, how does this work? I think it's uh, similar to what he was saying before. Uh, there is a concept called the liquid democracy, where right. by you can give your vote to someone that you trust, uh, but you can mm. take that vote away mm. immediately and give it back to someone else. So you don't have mm. to wait for five year cycles uh, and you can mm. vote on anything. So for most things you don't know anything about, you let someone else vote for you. But if something you care about and you, or you know about steps in, you can vote directly and wow. possibly VI blockchain mechanism, but that's yeah. for cryptography. Okay, I know about, that's good. Okay, one last answer over here. Yeah, or I think uh, what you just said is a very important element that would have to be in there. Another important element that might have been in some of what you were saying as well is that we don't want to lose that principle of uh, federalism, where one of the risks of having a world government is that you every experiment becomes so high stakes that everything can be lost if it goes wrong. So you really want uh, an opportunity to experiment at a more local level and have the successes ripple up. Right, the A-B testing kind of, so to speak. Great, so um, I just need to conclude to, 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 to say that um, uh, those are what I don't know, but the book has a lot more of what I was certain about and <laughs> those kinds of things extended to <laughs> um, things like um, uh, screening, the fact that there would be more screens in the world, uh, flowing, interacting, uh, questioning. So the last thing I want to say is, is that um, I think in the future when we want to have an answer we ask a machine. Machines will give us answers. I think what we're gonna be moving to is as answers become free and ubiquitous and very, very accurate, we ask Alexa and it gives the right answer again and again and again and again, is, is that we're gonna uh, start to value questions more and more. That asking a good question will be what we want humans to do and what we'll be try to train to do and that they, uh, in the long term, or should, at least the near term, asking a good question will be more important than a good answer. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kevin.